Hi, everybody. Welcome to Narrative Live on a Tuesday night. It's going to be a really fascinating hour tonight. We're really excited to have, really honored to have a guest uh, from Jersey, which is an island in between France and England, right there in the English Channel. It's closer to France than it would be to, to England. Uh, Stuart Sivray is here, and he is, as we'll explain to you in the next hour, a real hero amongst the people of Jersey because, because he has been able to not only expose um, the incredible child abuse that happened there over almost half a century, but he also has been able to bring light to the world about how um, corrupt and, and mob-driven the entire island really is. Uh, Stuart, uh, welcome to the show. It's great to have you with us tonight. Good evening. Thank, Thank you for having me on. And LB's here. How are you, LB? I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> this has been a rush getting on the air tonight, but here we are. Um, we've never had a guest from Jersey, so it's exciting. Um, if you were if you were going for a a, a quick uh, run to the supermarket that wasn't on the island, would you you wouldn't you would go to France, right? You wouldn't go to to Britain it's, it's, in terms of figuring out where you want to go shopping. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh sure, sure. Jersey's, Jersey's a lot. Of okay, and it's just one of those uh, quirks of history that it landed up being part of England and not part of uh, not part of France. Uh, uh, sure, sure, but basically, the Channel Islands were, were part, part of the, um, of Normandy. Normandy. Okay. In the age of William, William the Conqueror. And it's always been a. And, England. So go ahead. And, and, and when, when William, William the Conqueror was leader in England, in England in 1066, 1066 and all that, ultimately, ultimately it meant that the Channel Islands loyal to then, then, British Channel, you know, to William the Conqueror. Have we been having a sound issue? You may have been having an echo, an echo that may have disappeared now if I correctly press my buttons. Has it gone away? I was hearing a bit of an echo, but it, I think it's, it's better now for my time. Okay. Um, I hope it is. Let me know if it isn't, and then we'll try to uh, fix it as we go along. Um, I, I think they're hearing it on me too. Yeah. Can you, is it, how am I doing? You're not, I don't hear an echo with you. And okay. I, I think, it, I, think right. I may have Let corrected the issue. Uh, okay, everything Stuart, is good. Yeah, okay, good. Awesome. Sorry about okay. that, everybody. Things, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> too many Sorry. buttons to press for my for my liking. Um, but it's, uh, you know, what I what I find so fascinating about your story, I'm trying to find the way in for an audience that might not be so familiar with it, but we all remember the scandal around Jimmy Savile, um, who was a famous entertainer in the UK, not so famous uh, in the United States, but was well known enough for people to know that it was a big deal. He was a BBC sort of child uh, show entertainer and broadcaster. Uh, and really, really well known in the UK. Most of the kids in, you, in the UK would have grown up uh, watching Jimmy Savile until um, everything came crashing down. He was accused of being part of this child abuse uh, scandal that erupted in Jersey. Um, and of course, he wasn't, mm -hmm. in fact, one of the first people to be accused. There was a long history of you fighting for uh, justice for these children that had been abused there. Um, and you were the health minister on the island of Jersey, which has its own sort of jurisdiction. It's not part of the UK particularly uh, or necessarily. And then it's, uh, and so you were the health minister at the time and uh, you had jurisdiction over the health services, health and services, um, uh, what would you call it? The part of the city that, or part of the island that oversaw the children's ho health, or yeah. children's homes, right? Yeah. Sorry, I'm stumbling a little bit on the words there. Um, so tell us a little bit about how you came to hear about the fact that there was almost half a century of child abuse uh, that was going on in Jersey. Well, I, I was um, a senator then in the island's parliament, and um, I was the minister for health and social services. You know, I was a cabinet member. You know, with the executive responsibility, legal and political responsibility for health and social services on the island, and it started to become drawn to my attention by a few minor things at first towards late 2006, that standards were, were not good and were not improving and problematic things were happening in the island's social services system, the island's childcare system. So I started, you know, inquiring into these things, you know, as you do, you know, wanting to try and make sure that things are not getting too bad and, you know, where things have gone wrong, they're getting fixed. But the more I dug into the issues, the more and more disturbing things I discovered. And I started having to work directly with whistleblowers and survivors. So there were a lot of good frontline staff, you know, who, who came to me as whistleblowers. And it became absolutely clear to me, it was quite a, a hard thing to 
get your head around when, when you're like a member of the cabinet and you've actually got the legal responsibility for child protection. And it started to dawn on me, certainly in early 2007, that my own senior civil servants were simply lying to me. And not only to me, it was pretty much clear that this had been a feature of the system, the Jersey way, so to speak, mm-hmm. for, for, for decades. And the the more I started asking you know, questions about things like the child custody system in Jersey, where they were putting children into solitary confinement, uh, you know, difficult children, they were putting them in solitary confinement for months and months, years in some cases, rather than giving them the health care you know, and support and, and attention they needed. Now, they were being treated in ways that were simply illegal, you know, to treat an adult, you know, in, in, in these ways. And it became clear clear to me and the survivors and people I was working with that, in fact, you know, the, the Jersey police force in the past had been a part of the problem themselves. So we were investigating this with a view to slapping a big fat dossier of evidence onto the would desk you, of the Jersey. You say were part of the problem themselves, they were part of the abuse or they were just part of the cover-up? Uh, they, they, historically, they were very, very much part of the cover-up. There were, there were, there have been a few actual, you know, abusers and real crooks in, in the Jersey police, but you know, not, not the vast majority. The, the real problem with the police force was the cover-ups and the failures to properly and impartially and objectively investigate with a view to enforcing the rule of law. And we should explain course, that Jersey is one of those places where it's it's an offshore haven for a lot of very wealthy companies and individuals who want to hide their their wealth from taxes. So it creates a wealth divide. I mean, there is a lot of very, very wealthy people on, on your island and, uh, oh, and yeah. also uh, a lot of not very wealthy people on your island. And there's a mm-hmm. incentive for the wealthy people to keep things uh, quiet, as it were, uh, in terms of any scandal or anything like that, because they don't want their wealthy financial investors to be scared away by any scandal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that, that that's absolutely how it is. And, you know, I was one of the poor people, you know, my, my family come from, you know, certainly after World War Two, my particular part of the family were, you know, my, my, my grandmother was, you know, with her existing children, you know, was deported to a Nazi internment camp called Biberak, where she gave birth to my mother. And uh, I, and I, I suppose essentially you could say I ended up coming from like very, very poor working class or even underclass section of Jersey because my family was so damaged and, you know, and, and messed up by the occupation experiences. So when I first got into politics in Jersey, and it wasn't as any kind of like, you know, hard left, you know, kind of character. I got into politics by accident because a lot of the seats in the Jersey Parliament weren't even contested then. But I, yeah, I came from a very poor and and powerless background. So I was very conscious of the needs of poorer people in Jersey. And there was a huge, as you say, a huge wealth and, and class divide in, in Jersey. And, you know, the, the, the instances of how that's affected ordinary people on the island are, are many and varied. And that's a very big deal that you managed to get to all the way to Senator and then to the Health Minister. I mean, that's, that's a massive achievement for someone who came, as you say, from the poorer parts of the island. Um, and I gathered they weren't that uh, receptive to your arrival there. And, no, I mean, when I first got elected, firstly, as a deputy, which is like you know, where you represent a smaller district. And when you you know, if you get elected as a senator, you're voted for by the whole island as a constituency. Well, one of the reasons I and a few other people tried to get into local politics, because we knew that basically the system was corrupt and class ridden and, and not responsible. So we wanted to try and change it. So I was never expecting, even back then when I was 25, you know, in 1990, I, I wasn't expecting it to be easy or to be an easy ride. But the the sheer degree of hatred and and resentment and, and anger and hostility that the senior establishment people in the legislature and, and, and the judiciary, you know, which are both in, in, intermingled on Jersey, they felt me it was quite startling, you know, uh, and that was very much a part of my experience throughout my time in the Jersey legislature. Um, absolute, absolute class war. You know, the, these people felt absolute contempt uh, and, and resentment to anyone representing poorer interests. And we'll find out during this hour what happened uh, to your political career over there. But last night on BBC, 
there was a remarkable documentary that was made about you and everybody else of, on the island of Jersey that uh, really was kind of spectacular to watch and heartbreaking as well because of the amount of pain and, and suffering that uh, some of the people on the island went through. But spectacular because you almost single-handedly drove interest in this, uh, in this investigation and made sure that justice did come to light over almost, you know, I don't know how many years, probably over two decades or longer. Um, and so uh, you had a bit of a moment last night where hopefully, um, you know, you were redeemed by, by the BBC in some ways by putting on this documentary about you. Well, perhaps I, I wouldn't say I, I was alone in driving forward the issues. I mean, I, I was um, a politician, so I was, I was trying to be a, a responsible and good politician. And, you know, I was discovering things from my constituents and believing them and taking them seriously and other people like whistleblowers. So as, as a politician, as you would expect, you know, a, a good politician to be, I was simply like the the, the, the spearhead and, and the public voice for what was actually a, a much broader grassroots kind of issue. I wouldn't have discovered the things I discovered nor been able to fight them had it not been for the bravery and, and assistance uh, of, of others. Yeah, but there was a half a century of politicians before you that uh, didn't do anything about it, and they must have known. Oh, I think I think it's a lot worse than that. I think you're looking at li literally, frankly, millennia of poor governance mm -hmm. on Jersey. And Jersey is essentially, Jersey is very much and still actually a feudal society, literally. And people may not grasp this, but you know, the, the monarchy still has huge power when it comes to places like Jersey. So we'll perhaps get onto that a bit later, but yeah. back, just to move back a bit to address a point yeah. you, you raised earlier, um, when these things started to get exposed, you know, I, 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 as health and social services minister, I was investigating you know, the child protection failures and the cover-ups. And I happened coincidentally to get asked a question uh, about you know, a, a social services matter in the Jersey parliament in July, 2007. So I gave an honest answer to that question, which was actually covered in the documentary last night. And I said, look, frankly, if I'm being asked, do I have actual confidence in Jersey's child protection systems? Frankly, I have to say no. And I'm going to commission an independent, independent external investigation. And, and you know what, you know, I didn't know. I'm going to stop you there because I have that clip ready to play. Sure. I'm going to play it yeah. and then LB will hear from you. On the other side of that, I was going to try to get you in before, but this is a good time to, no, to play this clip. Fine. It's 16th July, uh, 20. 2007. Senator Sivray had been very concerned and he made a statement in the states of Jersey that he did not have any confidence in his own department in terms of the way in which they dealt with child protection. We are failing badly in this area and um, I'm probably going to be seeking to initiate a major independent review into the whole sphere of child welfare, child protection in Jersey. All of a sudden, he was making these really strong allegations against his own officers publicly. Um, that's unacceptable that, that, under any ministerial code. I had a great kind of sympathy for the issues that he was raising, but very often he was very confrontational in terms of staff. And he did lay himself open, really, to the possibility of his removal, which is... I'm going to stop there because I don't want to take too much of the documentary. People have to see it themselves. Mm -hmm. But those two people who just spoke there, one was the former first minister, the other one is a former, uh, was an external home affairs minister. Um, home affairs minister. I mean, they, live in, they seem to live in a lovely home. So they seem to have lovely places, very palatial looking places. And their reasoning behind... Um, you know, being upset with you about this and and taking action as they did later on with you is is you know is so ridiculous considering the scale of things you were reporting. You're reporting this massive amount of child abuse, mm -hmm. and they're concerned about the fact that you know you might have been a little inappropriate with staff. Well, but both of those individuals, as you correctly observe, are fantastically rich. They're both multi, multi, multi millionaires, and um, the things that they are saying there about me confronting staff are simply untrue. You know, this was one of the, the key kind of like, um, um, you know, um, kind of tactics that the establishment used against me. They had to find some excuse, some grounds for, um, you know, criticizing me and removing me. You know, they, they had to get rid of me in order to get the child abuse cover-up 
get the lid back down on it all because they weren't aware that those establishment politicians and the judiciary on Jersey were not aware, as I wasn't, and the people I was working with, we were not aware of the covert police investigation. So when I first started raising these matters publicly in the Jersey parliament, the Jersey establishment, as it were, the, the, the Jersey mob thought that if we can just crush and discredit Stuart Sivray, we can get the whole lid back down. Which is so everything. often the case that, with, yeah. with critics. Yeah, that, that'll, be our, that'll be our problem solved. So they, they came up with this pack of lies that I had been, you know, like kind of angrily confrontational staff, uh, you know, senior management staff. In fact, the opposite was the case. You know, I, I remember actually having one of my uh, very senior civil servants, deputy chief officer, in fact, literally screaming abuse at me across the boardroom table for asking questions about the failures of the then Jersey Child Protection Committee, a kind of small quango. And the aggression and the bullying and hostility and problem creating was all directed at me by very powerful, very senior civil servants and their political allies. But, you know, as we know from when you study the cases of whistleblowers in systems, it's always the case that the system that's doing something wrong and wants to cover it up best form of defense is attack they attack the whistleblower for something right. so this was exactly the same script this was exactly the same game gameplay you know so there was no truth in in th that uh, at all and in fact one of the pretty senior civil servants in my department at least at least one of them probably more bluntly are absolutely uh, horrifying, multi-victim, uh, Savile-esque child abusers. Oh, wow. And those, those particular you know, I individuals are walking free on Jersey to this day. Unbelievable. LB, do you have any uh, things you want to jump in here and then uh, we'll pick it up on the storyline a little bit? Yeah, I do. I do. Uh, so I, wanna, I do want to give a, I know it is, it, it would be amazing for everyone watching this who hasn't seen the BBC documentary, which just happened last night, um, or is not aware of Stuart's journey to watch that. Um, and I know we don't want to take away from that, but I do think it's important here to give a little bit more context so everybody can understand really what Stuart's job was mm -hmm. and the risk that he didn't even know he was taking just by doing his job. Um, mm -hmm. So what had been happening uh, it is specifically what's shown in the BBC documentary. They really focus on one of the children's homes where children uh, and the ages were, how young were they, Stuart? Like three or five up to- Oh, some, in some cases, yes. Some, some of them were, yeah. were you know- like, Some of them uh, were in, in little, little, yeah. little, little babies, orphans, uh, uh, up to wh whatever the age of adult was. I don't know when they aged out, 16, 17, 18. Yeah, um, back back in the old back in the days when HDLG uh, Odell Garan was operating, basically children were kind of you know just thrown out, you know, at the age of sixteen, you know, basically sixteen. Okay, so there was the documentary. Although there were several homes focused on one home, and that uh, it, can you pronounce the name of it? It's difficult for me. I, I have a bad. Hotel especially Garen. I had dental work today. Yeah, Lagaran, right? Mm -hmm. Hotel Le Garen, Yeah. yeah. Hotel Le Garen, yeah. which became a big explosive story in the UK. I, we didn't get oh. much of it over here, quite frankly, not as much as, as we probably should have. But this was a this was an industrial scale rape factory of, for children who were the most vulnerable children uh, uh, within that that were the citizens of Jersey and that the Jersey government was responsible for, and they were yeah. being. Uh, sexually, emotionally, physically abused on an industrial scale at this at this place by many, many people. The, the documentary didn't get too much into outsiders coming in outside of Jimmy, mm -hmm. um, whatever his name is, uh, but uh, the Stop people me. working there. Yeah. And but every every night and the survivors, those who were able to survive this because many did not, those children mm -hmm. who were able to survive this and grew up have been trying to tell the story of this place and of what happened to them. And no one was believing them. And so Stuart comes into his job and his job literally is to oversee child protective services as a politician. And 
because mm-hmm. that was his new job as a son, as the senator, the the child, the child, the victims were coming to him and trying to get him to listen to their story and to believe them. And so Stuart is hearing story after story after story and meeting these victims, many of whom were terrified to even speak about it. So you're having to meet them in, in, in locations that they felt sure. safe with, right? And yep. you know, some in the dead mm-hmm. of night, some in the day. And yep. so here he is, this is his job to oversee child protective services. And all of these people are coming to him and telling him how they were victimized within the system. Real crimes, massive crimes against them and on a, on a level that have been being covered up. So what Stewart does and what you see in the documentary, despite all of the uh, those two individuals that are on there, and I mainly the man was like the worst to me um, of just calling him, you know, attacking him. What he did was he went to the floor of the of, of the Senate right where they were and said, we have a problem. We need to address it. Um, this is what it is. And, and they all seem to know what it was, Stuart. Everybody was like, stop, stop, don't talk, don't talk, don't talk. It's not like they literally shut him down while he was speaking and said, we're going to close the session if you don't shut up. And he just kept saying, and you were literally only saying, we just need to look into this, please. We have a problem. We have to investigate. I'm going to do an investigation, right? Right. This just really, I'm just trying to do my job here. And the whole parliament yeah. freaks out and they stop so that this can't be on the record. They were so terrified that you were even speaking mm. truth onto the record. And the truth was simply at that time, I'm getting victims coming to me and we need to look into this. That was what he was saying, everybody. That was it. Now the police investigation was going on that you didn't know about, and then that explodes. Mm-hmm. And the whole thing gets weaponized in this way that is just insane. So I recommend everybody watch the BBC, watch that documentary. But um, I think it's re- it's just important to give the context of how massive the abuse was, how long it had been gone, that there were survivors, they were coming to you, this came to you out of left field, and you were just trying to do yeah. your job. Yeah. Most of the survivors, traditionally people that are, are, are poor and powerless and have been harmed by the excesses of power on Jersey, are terrified, you know, of, of rocking the boat. You know, people are frightened of the establishment. So even a lot of survivors and victims who had been, you know, living with what happened to them for many, many, many years had never spoken out about it, never dared to go to a politician about it or anything of that nature. Um, but because, you know, I, I had, you know, a, a good public rep record as being, you know, fairly, you know, fearless and, you know, doing what was right, asking the right questions, you know, and um, believing people and, and not being a part of the traditional establishment. That gave me, I think, a, a, a degree of trust by by survivors and victims that perhaps, and a, a degree of security that they felt that they could come to me and, you know, they weren't going to be victimized or something terrible because they'd spoken to a politician. So I I guess I was the first politician, you know, effectively on the scene in Jersey, who people felt they could trust and open up to about these things. And that's kind of like how and why, you know, I guess people started to come to me. And one of the international, you know, I think things that's useful for an international audience to recognize about Jersey that Jersey depicts itself as being an immensely respectable, thoroughly law-abiding place, you know, with its proper prosecution system, police force and judiciary, and it's very, very well regulated. You know, that's that's the official spin about Jersey. And of course, Jersey hosts, you know, a transnational, a global finance industry economic, right. economically, it's worth trillions of dollars. And you know, when you look at the claims by Jersey to be a, a, a safe and respectable offshore finance centre, you have to ask yourself, well, how much of that can we believe? If this place cannot do something as rudimentary and doesn't want to do something as basic and rudimentary as protect children from abuse, and it will, in fact, oppress and suppress you know, and make the major opposition politician for speaking out about child abuse, if this place doesn't care, about children's rights to that degree 
Can we really expect it to be properly and seriously and effectively regulating a dark money offshore finance industry that's worth billions of years? Of course not. If these people can't protect vulnerable children, they're certainly not going to protect good governments and good citizens around the world from money laundering and all kinds of other financial crimes. Exactly. We can be quite sure of I, that. And I think it goes a step further for me in terms of trying to really understand, and I still don't understand it. I can make a guess and a really good educated guess, but there aren't, there isn't an answer to this right now. And the question is, why did all of these people believe in the establishment, the health, the ministers themselves, and the only people they answer to, which is the crown? Okay, this doesn't go through parliament. Mm -hmm. It goes right to the crown. Um, it sort of skips over that, right? Jersey does. So mm -hmm. why did they believe that protecting children threatens their finance industry? With that, who's drawing that parallel? If anything, you know, and they kept in the documentary, I was so struck by that, that minister that was technically, I guess, your boss, the man in the blue shirt and the really, you know, fabulous living room, Frank, whatever Frank that was. Walker. Frank Walker. I was struck mm -hmm. by him over and over and over again. Every time the camera was on him, he kept say, he kept saying what a, th what, how, this excuse of like, well, this is something that happens everywhere. Child abuse happens everywhere. It's not unique to Jersey. So we didn't want to be branded with that because that would hurt Jersey. And I was looking out for Jersey. That was his take. And it's like, well, your own argument defeats your thing. If child mm -hmm. abuse does happen everywhere, then why is Jersey incapable of addressing it and helping the victims? It doesn't sure. hurt your sure. brand. To, to actually, by your own argument, it does not hurt you to actually care for those children. It actually hurts you to not care for them and to cover up abuse. That's what hurts you. So what is really going on here? I don't feel satisfied that we got an answer as to what's really going on. I don't. No. I'm sorry, guys. I don't. Yeah. Something else is going no. on. Yeah. You're, 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 you're absolutely you're absolutely right. Look, Jer Jersey's become the the first and only jurisdiction on the face of the planet to sack a social services minister for trying to protect children. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, it says a lot. You know, I mean, so I mean they, they what obviously does that say about the true nature of governance here. The place seems to be run entirely by the desire to grow the finance sector. I mean, looking at that documentary and doing the research, it does feel like that's all they really care about is growing the finance sector and making sure that you know the, the, they attract as much business into the onto the island, and therefore that gets prioritized over everything else. And um, and in that they have to sign a um, agreements with these companies, including companies like Apple, that says that you know mm -hmm. they're going to guarantee a, a, a secure government. They're going to guarantee yeah. that it's going to be free of scandal. That it's you know they're, they're a strongly regulated place, and they and they're you know mm -hmm. they don't want to look under any of stones because if they do turn up anything anything nasty, then they're going to have to reveal that to their um, these investors and then contradict their their assurances to those companies and those wealthy people. I sure. think that's that's the mechanism, and it's obviously wrong. But I also think the other thing that you're pointing to is there is sort of a Especially when you look at the at the monarchy itself, there are you know several ties to to different scandals revolving um, underage children, and of course one of them recently with the Epstein scandal was Andrew, um, and yep. that that became a big news thing that it got Andrew, you know, didn't have his all his uh, titles taken away from him, um, but the other one that came mm -hmm. that reminds <laughs> me of is Jimmy Savile himself was really good friends with Prince Charles, who is the heir That's to right. the throne. I mean, and I would yeah. say really good friends, they're really good friends. There's some photographs um, of just the various times throughout their career um, that you saw Charles with Jimmy Savile. There was plenty of opportunity for um, for Charles to know what Jimmy Savile was up to. And yet oh, we indeed. didn't find out about Jimmy Savile until several years after you found out uh, that this uh, child abuse was happening, that there may have been some sort of cover up um, involving yeah. Jimmy's involvement in that. Well, the, the Jersey child abuse um, controversy, you know, kicked off, as we've already explained, in July 2007. And as I, as I discovered later in 2007, because, you know, paradoxically enough, because the 
establishment had sacked me as a health and social services minister, you know, in an effort to discredit me. That had the opposite effect to what they wanted. Suddenly, dozens, dozens, maybe hundreds of child abuse victims who in the yeah. past have feared, feared that they were never going to be believed, they suddenly thought, my God, we're, we're not alone. Other people suffered the same thing. Here's somebody in power wanting to investigate it, and he's been clobbered by the system. So we know he's, he's right and he's good. So, you know, th th that just flooded to me. And it was late in 2007, I think, going from memory, when I, I, I heard, you know, indeed from one of the, one of the um, you know, people interviewed in, in the film, one of the survivors in, in the film last night, you know, I started to hear about Savile and, and his activities on Jersey. And it's it's fascinating that, you know, in spite of this, the real truth about Jimmy Savile didn't come out until late 2011, after his death. Mm -hmm. So you have a situation whereby here was an investigation going on, on on Jersey that could have, could have brought Jimmy Savile to justice mm -hmm. before before his death. Right. Now, the, the so he basically the died and no one, found, no one found out until after his death is basically what happened, right? I, I think, Close you know, when you study the when you study the, the kind of British um, establishment attitudes to child abuse and child, you know, protection failures, it's actually kind of, it was actually kind of pretty well known behind the scenes among Savile's kind of circle, you know, and I think even you know, investigative journals like Private Eye magazine might have published the odd little, you know, allegation about him being an abuser um, in, 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 in the past. But of course, the whole system, you know, was on his side, you know, he was, Sir Jimmy Savile, OBE, friend of the royal family, um, and, you know, had all those kind of connections. He was a famous fundraiser for charities and so on. So even though there, were, there was plenty of rumour amongst the British establishment circles and those in power about Savile, none of it was ever acted upon. And there were a lot of other very senior... Sorry? I just want, I just want people to understand that... What, that the connection with Savile is that there were victims that from this hotel, say it again, the place. Hotel de la Garen. There were victims from Hotel de la Garen who had identified him as coming to that facility and abusing them there. That he knew that this was a place to go and abuse children as an outsider, yeah. not someone who worked there. So it's because the abuse victims were naming him, but not Stuart. Mm -hmm. The abuse victims yeah. were naming him. Okay. So I want to make that clear. Yeah. Well, well, one of the, at least one, probably more, frankly, of the, of the uh, senior civil servants in, in my own department, um, who is a child abuser and he's still walking around free today, was, you know, friends with Savile and, and, and knew of him. Um, I think, having kind of had to delve into the whole Jersey child abuse cover up, it's absolutely clear that the place was known and regarded as a soft touch for child abusers, for pedophiles, certainly throughout the post World War Two years, you know, and you know, Jersey was occupied by the Nazis uh, during World War Two. And interestingly, some of the very some of the older, quite elderly people who had been orphans in Odela Garen during the World War Two period, said that they were actually treated better and well during the Nazi occupation period than they had been before or that they were after. Because, you know, the, 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 these, you know, traditional inherited Jersey crime families, some of them at least were frightened of the Nazis. That's, you know, in addition to the rest of them that were collaborating with the Nazis. So this, this goes back decades and decades. And I think it's absolutely clear. One of the things that I've learned so I've had to become quite an expert in, you know, what I what I call the the political economy of child abuse, and it's become very clear to me that child abuse is a tool in the, the mafia toolbox, and has been, you know, around the world, you know, for for many many decades. You know, you know, I call it the um the commodity of concealment, you know, and and an absolutely key way that mafias mafia syndicates get power is via entrapment. Yes, you know, and right. clearly, I think Jer Jersey was used actually as an entrapment venue for various influential and powerful people 
over the decades. I think that that much is is, is very clear. And you know the, the people doing you know, the entrapping and the, the kind of mafia syndicates that run Jersey, who are essentially all of Jersey's law firms. You know the, the, the law firms are the mafia syndicates. Um, they, you know, knew that you know they could do all this really really hardcore corruption on Jersey without really any fear of really being properly brought to justice because these are the people who control the system. You know one. The way an, an economical way to describe Jersey is simply that this place is a mob town. Okay, it's simply a, a total mob town, and the Jersey mafia syndicates, which are centuries and centuries old, have achieved that kind of um, ultimate ambition that all good, uh, good, you know, quote unquote, cunning mafias aspire to, right. which is the condition of simple invisibility. Right. You know, and and that's how that's how the Jersey mafia syndicates have controlled the island and been so successful for so long. They don't have to run around and shoot people, because you know, traditionally, they are the police force, they are the prosecution system. They, they, they own the everything. Yeah. And why yeah. is such a striking story is because in fact that's what's happening around the world. I mean, the same things that mm. you're describing that happened in Jersey is what is currently happening with transnational crime around the world as sure. mob. Uh, you know, mob figures try to take over governments. And we saw it with Donald Trump. We've seen it in other countries where the organized crime is sort of coming out of the underworld and taking over our government. And the price Boris that, that, yeah, well, Boris Johnson, exactly. And the price that people pay for that is the abuse of these children, for example, just as one example. It's because, you know, these governments that want to be autocratic and tyrannical are interested in money and power. They're not going to be interested in looking after the children or looking after your rights in any other way, whether it's women's rights or speech or anything else. They're interested only in the money. And so allowing them even a toehold of power is so dangerous to democracy around the world. And there's you know, something so striking about the documentary yesterday that really showed you what would happen in the if you let this go get out of control, that you would Lend, you land up sacrificing your children. Yeah. And I, I, for example, at least since the early 1990s, the collapse of communism, Russian money, Russia, and there's no, there's no meaningful yeah, distinction right. between the state and the mob in a place like yeah. Russia. And indeed, mm -hmm. that's probably true in a, a lot of most other jurisdictions around the world, but it's particularly acute in Russia. The Russians were clearly laundering in the chaos of the collapse of communism. They were putting billions and billions uh, you know of dollar equivalents of, of russian money being laundered through jersey and the, yeah. the the jersey elite and the city of london british elite are so greedy frankly and amoral they gradually over a period of some decades have become basically poisoned and bought and purchased by all this foreign money power and now we see russian power in britain is just extraordinary you know boris johnson appointed the sun of a former KGB boss into the Jersey, sorry, into the London, into the UK legislature. You know, yeah. you know we've, so we've got a KGB, you know, son of a KGB man. And only today it was revealed that they've just spent like two and a half million pounds refitting the press facilities in Downing Street. And they've used a Russian firm to do it. Yeah. I mean, to install yeah. microphones so, and, and receivers. Yeah. It's, yep. it's awful. And so what's going to happen is, you know, these this Russian mob is swamping our democracy in a way that is, you know, just untenable for Western societies. And and maybe we're learning in Jersey how untenable it is. I'm going to play another clip from this from the documentary because uh, this is a very, very powerful clip and then we'll come back and talk afterwards. Coming up again and again, that was Hope de Lagaran, children's home. Well, there was one particular case file I looked at where there appeared to be gaps. I was given some excuses as to why it hadn't been dealt with, and when we looked into it, those excuses just fell apart. And that was the real beginning then of Operation Rectangle, although it didn't become Operation Rectangle for a little while after that. The few victims that I met totally impressed me with their sincerity and their fear. I was born in Jersey to Irish parents. My parents were from Cork, church town. When I was five, I went to Hope Le Garen Children's Home. It 
We had a lot of children living in the home. Not only from Jersey, we had them from Guernsey as well. You had a lot of French immigrants that came to work on the farms. They were poor people as well. They found that the accommodation for the children, they wasn't there for them. So they ended up in the home, you see. Myself and some other lads had broken into a shop and we'd stolen some cigarettes and uh, chocolates and various other things. So I was sent to um, Oak de Garen. By the Royal Court of Jersey, I was there between 1963 and 64. It was run by a man called Colin Tilbrook. He ran the home like an army camp. Tilbrook is a very strict and very, very aggressive man. When he spoke to you, he didn't speak to you, he shouted at you. As young boys, I think, we made up this uh, little song. There's a man who walks through the ward late at night, Mr. Tilbrook, Mr. Tilbrook, with his little black bag and his knife as out tight, Mr. Tilbrook, Mr. Tilbrook. I was terrified if he was to call me into his little office because I knew what he wanted from me, you see. It wasn't just myself, he used to call on other children as well. We used to say, we're going to tell somebody. And he used to say, well, go ahead, because no one's going to believe you. Operational police officers were saying there is a historic problem of child abuse at Hort de la Garenne. We're getting snippets of it as part of other inquiries. Graham Parry then decided that we would instigate Operation Rectangle, but keep it on the wraps. And a lot of people know each other. Bob's over there. All right, sorry about that. At the end, it got cut off. But, uh, well, that's hard to watch. You know, it is hard to watch and listen to those testimonies. And yet here they are finally getting to tell their stories uh, on the BBC, which is quite something that they've been able to finally tell their stories. I mean, Jimmy um, Savile was a was an entertainer on the BBC. So for the BBC to be putting yeah. this out is, is a fairly big deal. Um, has anyone from the palace actually uh, responded to any of this? Has anyone from the, the the inner workings of the crown actually said, you know, we apologize, we're devastated, we this should never have happened? Has Charles ever said anything about this? Yeah. No, one, one of the things that, that your audience need, needs to understand about the, the Channel Islands, of which Jersey is one, and also the Isle of Man, you know, where they have the famous motorcycle race. We are what, what are called crown dependencies constitutionally. So we're not actually part of the United Kingdom, but we are still British. And what most people, even on these small islands, don't know, they just don't get it, you know, constitutionally and legally. And I didn't really appreciate this until all of this kind of oppression started to happen. That whilst the United Kingdom is a constitutional monarchy, in which the monarch is the head of state, but only kind of, you know, doesn't have any power. And ultimately, it's the government ministers that make the decisions. And whatever they advise the monarch, the monarch has to go along with. Constitutional monarchy. That's not what prevails on places like Jersey. Jersey, actually, when you dig into it, when you can go back to the kind of British constitutional things like the Act of Settlement, you know, uh, and things of that nature, the Crown dependencies were expressly written out of this kind of deal that the monarchy had to sign up with in order to establish the United Kingdom. So actually, when it comes to places like Jersey, we are still, you know, covertly, we are still a pure monarchy. Owned but by the Queen, when it literally comes, owned yes, by the Queen. I don't know about owned so much, but she is the power, the, the head of the state. And ultimately, if the Jersey establishment are lobbying, successfully lobbying the palace and the Queen's courtiers and all of that kind of thing, if, say, a British government minister said, we're a bit worried about what's going on in Jersey, we think this is, you know, very poor, you know, standards of governance, there's a breakdown in the rule of law there. And they had said this, you know, it had been discussed in Privy Council, it had been discussed with the monarch. If the monarch says, well, you know, you know, uh, well, I, you know, I, I think it's just fine. You know, um, because, you know, she, she will have been, and her apparatus, her court, will have been very, very heavily lobbied by the powerful Jersey elites, then th there was no way that they're going to intervene uh, to cure the, the 
complete breakdown in, in governance uh, on, on Jersey. And it is a complete breakdown. You know, it, it, it's that overtly corrupt. And you, you have to wonder, you know, when the child abuse controversy erupted on Jersey, what actual role, you know, did somebody like Prince Charles or Prince Andrew play, you know, in speaking to their to their mother and, you know, just contributing into that whole lobby, this whole mystical court. One of the huge problems with the United Kingdom as an entity, as a country, is this absence of a written constitution. And when you try to dig into it, where actual proper accountable lines of responsibility lay, you know, when you try to get to you know, proper governance, the actual effective rule of law, who's responsible for which part, into the centre of the British constitutional situation, it all just dissolves into fog. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, the Queen there's certainly new, is above the law. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing you can do mm-hmm. to take to you know to put the Queen behind bars, and certainly her family can't be mm-hmm. um, you know prosecuted in a, in a in a criminal way. Sorry, in a civil way, they can't be in a criminal way. But it's very very hard to get justice uh, if the if the Crown oh, or sure. the people that they um, that they have around them, the courtiers, whatever you want to call them, they can commit crimes pretty much, you know, without with impunity sure. because there's just there's no mechanism that really stops them, and so you look at a structure like uh, like the dependencies where you've got you know huge amounts of financial crime, and let's just call it what it is. It's a ton of money laundering taken yeah. illegally from places like Russia, stolen out of Russia from the people of Russia yeah. by the leaders of Russia funneled into Jersey and then funneled out to buy fancy condominiums in every city in the world, every big city in the world. That's what's buying those condos that everyone loves because, hey, look how nice our streets look. Those condos are being bought by dirty money stolen from the Russian people or out of um, human trafficking or out of drug trafficking or or any of those kinds of things. Sorry, go ahead. Okay. This is where where I come in. (laughs) But I just want to complete that point. I, I w- that, can I just finish that one point? That just the money's coming yes. is you know the queen or the royal family or whomever is overseeing each of these uh, offshore holdings. They are saying it's okay. They are actually blessing that money because they're saying it's okay that that money's coming from from dirty sources and washing through my banks. Go ahead. Yes, all true. So I think what we're What's important to say now is we're really talking about, even though Stuart has brought us all the way back to, you know, this is centuries of stuff going on with these with the islands. Um, but really, because we came in on the abuse, I think that the years to look at that are important are from the 70s and 80s all the way up to the mid 2000s. Mm-hmm. So that's mm-hmm. the block of time we're talking about here. And in that scope of time, um, we had the fall of the Soviet Union. Mm-hmm. And so there's there's more, you, everyone wants to say Russian money. I would really encourage everyone who wants to keep looking into this to look into Kazakh money um, and some of the other former Soviet, um, especially the stands, mm-hmm. <laughs> the mm-hmm. ends of stand, look into mm-hmm. it, um, of the, of the, of the oh, yeah. Soviet empire, because the, the syndicate underneath that that has evolved with vladimir putin right at the head of it eventually um but that's a that's a 30 40 year evolution as well of a crime syndicate yeah. that was interconnected before the soviet union file and its connections didn't change so it, mm-hmm. it's a it's a little broader even than just russia today uh, because the syndicate underneath everything, and I, I say it in a singular term because it is sort of one big morass, but it has many, many tentacles and many, you know, everyone can get into that with me later about, well, there's 2,000 different crime syndicates and blah, 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 blah. I don't care. I'm talking about this, the way of moving money through these, you know, the people who are the, in the power to move the money through these vehicles which are islands right through the financial mm-hmm. institutions that are there without without anyone on the other side of that meaning ultimately the queen the crown questioning how that money was made in the first place that's what doesn't get questioned now some of it because of that scope of time we also had you know a lot of people getting really really wealthy 
extraordinarily wealthy in the mid to the early to mid 2000s that just wanted to hide their wealth and not pay taxes on it. So they're blending their money in with all of this blood money that's coming from the movement of arms, human beings, drugs, nuclear material, even yeah. cigarettes, people like that's a big industry right? It's like so the, the the worst things that we can think of in terms of profit centers off of human misery that crime syndicates, international transnational crime syndicates are involved with is getting blended in with the money from people who are just wealthy because they're benefiting from a boom here or a boom there that this dirty money once laundered is helping to enact in where they live in the West. And then they're throwing their money through this so they can get around the tax avoidance. Why? Because they have the same lawyers and the same finance managers and the same accountants. So it yep. does come down to that uh, white collar class of lawyers, accountants, and finance managers and hedge fund managers that are enabling all of this. So oh. I always say, stand in the money, ask, okay, how is that money made? Or we're not gonna allow it to go through our institution. If that was put in place in Jersey, uh, we wouldn't be here talking about any of this. Frankly, I don't think we would. I do think it's connected um, to uh, oh, yeah. all of the other crimes on the island, if not sure. simply from a very easy place of saying, look, when no one's willing to look at any corruption, all corruption is available. Yeah. yeah and so it's a lawless, things... lawless place. It's a, I mean, maybe somebody jaywalks, look, if a kid steals a candy bar, he's going to yeah. get stick, stuck in a home. The law will show up to put that child in a home. Yeah. Um, you know, it, but the law was not showing up to then protect that mm -hmm. child from the crimes being committed uh, by the state, sure. frankly. I mean, I mean, hey, hey, look, I, I've, been, I've been politically imprisoned three times so far. I know. You know, I've become Jersey's first political prisoner since the Nazis got thrown out. And, you know, they can do that kind of thing. You know, yeah. but they, they, you know, they'll abuse the, the system. But they, they clearly when they do stuff like that, they're not going after actual the real criminals. On the contrary, because people like me and the things I was doing and working on were actually a threat to the transnational mafia syndicates and i try to popularize um a phrase when people look at places like jersey people think of them as tax evasion jurisdictions uh, to build on your point it's much more fundamental than just tax evasion what places like jersey are are law evasion mm -hmm. jurisdictions yeah, places right. like jersey represent a kind of quasi a, a mystical kind of parallel universe to the proper rule of law as is supposed to be shared in by responsible nation states and to work internationally. I call it the, the, the dark zone. And that's why the authorities in London are always absolutely rigid in their refusal to investigate anything to do with Jersey whatsoever. They want to keep this artificial firewall between the United Kingdom and between Jersey like the things that are going on and go wrong in Jersey are nothing to do with them, nothing to do with the United Kingdom, which isn't the case, of course, you know, constitutionally, ultimately, you know, the British state and the, and the monarch and so on do have responsibility for good governance on the islands. But they, the, the when you, let me explain it this way. Look at a place like Jersey, ask yourself, what is the product of Jersey that makes it host to trillions of dollars? And you know it's billions of money going through this place each year. What is the product that the island succeeds in selling? You know to the to the money world out there. That Blinders. product is what you call, that 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 product is what I call the non-law. You know, yeah. The mobs and mainly the city of London mobs are the people that really control places like Jersey. With, with a place like Jersey, their product is the ability to switch on or off like a tap. The rule of law mm -hmm. and and you know and that that's 
Yeah, that, that's what the product is. It's that's the invalid, non-water. That's an incredible Ooh. commodity. Yeah, it's it an incredible, incredible commodity. commodity. Yeah. It's a lot of money. Yeah. Um, so, you know, they, they call it financial services, but really it is a turning a blind eye to whatever bad stuff these guys might be doing. Now, one of the famous residents of Jersey is uh, this man, Roman Abramovich, who is the owner, uh, very famously, of the Chelsea Football Club, which anyone who follows football is in, in the UK would know this is a huge thing in America. They probably wouldn't recognize the name, but they I'm sure you do. So as a spectacularly wealthy gentleman, he comes from Russia. He's one of Putin's favorite oligarchs. He's the 13th mm -hmm. richest man in in all of Britain, even though he doesn't necessarily live there. Um, but he has a personal fortune of nine point three billion dollars, which is phenomenal, considering most of their money was probably stolen from the from the Russian people. And I would say probably because a lot of the oligarchs took their money from the from the state resources and made it off privatization. So I'm not suggesting he personally stole it, but that, you know, it came out of that wealth. Um, in um, in he tried to get a, a residency in Switzerland. He was rejected in 2016. And then in 2018, Along came the the Jersey and gave him a high value resident um, uh, state status, which basically means he can live in Jersey. He can't live in the UK. He can live in Jersey because he's got a lot of money, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that that's pretty much pretty much how it goes. I mean, certainly, for example, there's a Jersey law firm which has been controversially in the news recently, Ogiers. The Ogier Group, you know, involving a, a major like defrauding of a trust fund. That same firm and those same lawyers were running a, 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 a kind of a, a, an offshore finance vehicle called Fimaco in the early 1990s, and that was basically laundering hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. You know, the reason value out of Russia through a Paris-based bank. And these are the same. These are the same mobsters, basically. People like Julian Clyde Smith and Tim Lecoq, who's now the Crown appointed ah. head of the legislature and head of the judiciary. Wow. These people were running these rackets, and these are the same people that had me like illegally imprisoned. The same people that participated in the clearly illegal suspension of the good police chief Graham Power, when Graham was, you know, the, the police force under Graham's leadership were investigating some really serious foul criminals who were the clients of Ogiers, mm. of the Ogier group. And remarkably, when the illegally suspended police chief, Graham Power, attempted to bring a judicial review uh, against the uh, illegal suspension, the case was presided over by Julian Clydesmith, part-time lawyer, part-time judge. Right. And Julian Clydesmith failed to declare the profound conflict of interest he had. He failed to declare during that moment that, that he, in fact, was representing as a private sector lawyer some real toxic villains that the police force under Graham's leadership were trying to bring to justice. Now, this is just open, this is open judicial corruption you know, in the 21st just, century Britain. And I just want to circle back as well to Abramovich, because the reason he was not being allowed into the, U the United Kingdom and the United States is because he's been sanctioned for his interference or his government's interference in the American elections in 2016. So now, you know, Jersey's decided to flout those sanctions by letting him come on over, give us your billions and have a hot, nice house here under the protection of the Queen, even though the United States and the United Kingdom have sanctioned him. Um, and, and, you mm -hmm. know, that's just astonishing when you think about the, the you know, her, under her watch, under the royal watch, the sanctions are being flouted, money's being moved around uh, from Russia, and she knows what's going on, I and mean, she knows... But she yeah. must know that the her government is, you know, yes. it's wholly invested in by, by Russia, and uh, and so is the American government. Uh, she herself, the monarch herself, does a private banking through Jersey. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's right. Coot, coot, I, I, I believe it is. But let, let, let's kind of step back from it, and let's assume that the monarch, Queen Elizabeth, is not actually doing stuff criminally or knowingly herself, but is simply surrounded by you know really contaminated and toxic courtiers and power influences like for example the city of london corporation which date, dating back to magna carta and this is still the case to this day in many important respects the british monarch is actually constitutionally subservient to this ancient structure the state within a state called the city of london corporation really? now i i think you know 
one of the things that the British state, and I blame its security services and others for this, the British state somehow should have found ways of defending and protecting the monarchy from these kind of contaminations. Mm -hmm. You know, sleaze, you know, I mean, you know, uh, you know, her son, Andrew, being entrapped. What? Into chocolate I mean, you know, why, 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 I mean, one second, I'll be late. And, and, yeah, okay, go ahead. Finish your thought there, Stuart. Yeah. You know, uh, you know the, the British state has catastrophically failed, actually, to protect the institution of the monarchy. And all kinds of, you know, consequently catastrophic things have happened in Britain now. And in some ways, you know, a lot of this will have been, you know, deliberately planned and done and worked out by the Russians over decades. You know, with Brexit, for example, you know, getting Britain out of the European Union was was an, an, an undisguised Russian long-term strategic mm. objective. And, you know, it's massively weakened the West. Brexit is catastrophic, frankly, for, for Britain, let alone, you know, the, the interests of Western democratic proper law enforcement. It's just disastrous. And I think Britain basically didn't avoid the bullet that the USA has just dodged. You know, if, if Trump, if the insurrection had succeeded, frankly, you know, we would be looking frank, quite possibly at events that would be leading to the end of civilization as we know it. Britain, um, unlike, say, in World War One or World War Two, you know, and I think we are in a kind of de facto world war. Unlike in World War One or World War Two, you know, the European bridgehead, as it were, of Britain, this time has been defeated. I mean, we've, we've been, Britain has been defeated by there the Russians. A, there certainly has been a sense that they've been swamped by the Russian money and that has corrupted yeah. almost everything. Um, and yep. maybe even the monarchy, yeah. the, you know, maybe that's even the, what's going on. LB, you know, okay. it, 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 well, it's I, that I, serious. It, it's very serious. Uh, um, I think Andrew's official job and title and the powers that were vested in him by his mother between 2001 and 2011 when he was the sort of trade and financial envoy uh, uh, i think i think that's why the, there's massive trouble i do i think that's yeah. the underbelly of, uh, of the secret of both what was actually really going on with epstein and you know who was a master by that point uh, by the by the by towers, but frankly, Zev, like which was done in '95, um, even before then, because of his work at, with Bear Stearns offshore, the one thing Jeffrey Epstein was a genius at, he wasn't much of a genius at, and that really, truly was this guy was not that as bright as like Alan Dershowitz in his underwear want you to believe, but the the thing that Epstein could do better than anyone maybe on the planet by the time of his first arrest. Uh, was set up offshore havens for clients mm -hmm. and network mm -hmm. those havens to one another through financial services organizations. So um, when you go into the offshore leaks database and you see how the Queen's money is connected, uh, being pushed through Jersey and being set up by Appleby and uh, you know all of that, that was done by Andrew while he had still a quite a powerful relationship going on with Jeffrey Epstein. And I think that's at the core. If everyone just looks at the money, mm -hmm. just look at the yeah. money. The crimes against the children are, are horrific, and they allow mm -hmm. us finally to talk about the money. So mm -hmm. what Epstein must have mm -hmm. done for Andrew while he was running around the planet, especially in the Middle East, and with Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, with the, with the, with the former Soviet Union, uh, creating vehicles for the crown's money as uh, to grow it and pushing that through Jersey and other offshores, I can actually, Islands, all the other territories. Can, so I can say for sure that, you know, that there was more than enough speculation at the time that, uh, and it was print reporting to the, to this effect that Epstein was, was used to go around and say he represented the queen's money, that he was also a yeah. uh, part of, of, uh, investing in the queen's fortune. And you know, that when, um, he was first arrested, it was Prince Andrew that intervened on his behalf. That's why he got That's the lighter right. sentence. 
So you've got two instances there where we know that he was involved in the money management of, of the royal family and that the royal family intervened to get him off that case. And then on top of that, he was very, very close with Appleby in in, the, in Bermuda or, or Bahamas, one of those places, Amen. where he had an Amen. office. Amen. Yeah, we had an office at one of the Appleby um, um, big offices there. And so those are all the yeah. same structures that we find happening here in Jersey. Um, you know, you've got the royal family, you've got, you know, the, the crown, you've got Appleby, which is this financial services firm, but really it's just opening up offshore holdings for anyone without really checking where the money's coming from. And you've got Jeffrey Epstein, who's got... Uh, a human trafficking ring, which entraps politicians in order to keep them silent, um, which sounds a lot of like what's going on in Jersey, or what went on in Jersey. Yeah, at least. The, the law firm, the law firm Appleby Global, which is simply, I mean, we, it's important to start recognizing, I think, uh, just as the public, that the vast majority of mafia activity in the world doesn't involve, you know, running around having gunfights on the streets. Yeah. You know, as we're, we're, that's what Roberto Saviano has written so well about, you know, in his books, you know, That's Gamora right. and Zero Zero Zero. The, That's right. the, the, the big, big mafia activity has what he terms the, their civilian wings, you know, not actually street hoodlums, but the, you know, the real big, big part of the mafia, global mafia syndicates are what, what Roberto Saviano describes as the civilian wings of the mafia. Exactly. And those are, by and large, law firms. If you look at any really big, successful and law bankers. firm, certainly in, the city, certainly in the city of London, they're, they're, they, they are the mafia syndicates, you know, and, and certainly the yeah. city of London. I mean, you know, look at what's happened to me. You know, I've, I've got a, a unique attribute here. I, so far as I'm aware, I am the only human being out of all of the populations of the Council of Europe member states, not the EU, the Council of Europe. So that includes even places like Russia, which are supposed to obey the European Convention on Human Rights. I am the only human being in all of that vast population who has never been able to obtain legal representation. What do you mean by that? No, I, I've been completely politically suppressed and oppressed, you know, a victim of judicial corruption, and I've never ever been able to get a lawyer. Every there's no, there's no I've... public defenders there either, presumably. No. In New Jersey, there's just a system of rule. And you and you talk about this one time when uh, there was a secret proceeding, and this is one of the reasons you were you were jailed was a secret proceeding for you posting something online about what was going on in Jersey on your blog, and uh, and that was done by I guess a privacy commissioner or a data protection commissioner that had been established. Yeah, so Actually, it was the excuse, yeah. And and the law firm that was representing the other side, uh, you know, whoever that might be, was Appleby. Yep, Appleby Global. That that's correct. I mean, Appleby. The the, the whole campaign against me and the child abuse investigation is a straightforward act of, frankly, undisguised political oppression and suppression by Appleby Global. Appleby Global is simply a transnational mafia entity let's not beat about the bush and you know other other big entities like apple you know apple computers and google frankly colluded with appleby global back in 2008 and 2009 and in the years beyond in the covering up and the sabotage of the jersey child abuse investigation and you know like evidence that when they were prosecuting me for supposedly breaking the data protection law i was having to defend myself you know, they should have disclosed all relevant evidence to the defense side. And they didn't. And I only just dis only discovered many, many years later that, you know, basically, you know, the the Appleby Global side and their their witnesses were committing straightforward perjury, you know, in court against me. I just want to underline and that, because what you're saying is actually true, that Appleby got a court order out of the Jersey court to stop you from publishing details of what was going on in Jersey. And they forced Google, you know, big, clean, do no evil Google, to take your blog posts off the webs of the, of the internet, based on this ruling by this corrupt court in Jersey. And so, yeah. the people of the world didn't get to hear about what you knew about the crimes going on in Jersey. And uh, then a lot of it, yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. And then this this company, and you, and you've got this documentation. Just I want to show everyone what you've shared with us tonight. And I think this might be the first time people are, are seeing this. I mean, here is the Appleby um, 
court document and the and the letter they sent to Google, which very clearly asked them to take everything that you have on your blog site down and to that you should not be allowed to refer to anything going on in Jersey in terms of criminal issues that are going on in Jersey. And they're demanding this based on a criminal proceeding that, by the way, looks like this because it's completely secret, it's completely redacted, so no one can see what it looks like. This looks like a Mueller but, document, you know? There's nothing you can, there's like maybe two paragraphs in this entire court ruling that you can actually read. And, you know, Google does a decent enough job fending it off the first time in this email that you shared. But at the end of the day, they succumbed to the pressure from Appleby and this elite class of Jersey to suppress you and yeah. your voice, but mostly the reporting around some of this abuse that was going on in Jersey sure. for 40 years. That's absolutely correct. I mean, throughout the kind of like the criminal prosecution of me for supposedly breaking the data protection law and the later uh, secret proceedings, which, you know, it actually got reported on eventually when it concluded by the Jersey Evening Post, which is the only reason I can even refer to the existence of those proceedings. Those secret proceedings were kind of like basically civil proceedings taken against me in the name of proxies. And, you know, I... The first time, you know, yeah, it was just, you know, an extraordinary situation. And at no time, you know, either back in 2009 uh, and 10 or, or or whatever, was that those kind of documentations were disclosed to me. And, and again, either through the later civil proceedings. And indeed, you know, I expect probably to get arrested and put in jail again at any, any other time. I mean, you know, you can compare my situation to, say, Alexander Navalny. At least when he's being arrested and put in prison by the Russian state, it isn't actually being done by direct friends of Vladimir Putin, uh, people who are directly conflicted in these matters, sitting in court as the judge, you know, <laughs> and he gets legal representation. Yeah. I, I've had none of that. Now, I was really the only, to understand the contextualization of this a little better, Jersey was a very, and always has been, a very, very depoliticized place. There was no meaningful political opposition. So I was frankly the first ever and only significant, really to this day, kind of opposition political figure mm -hmm. that Jersey has ever had. And, you know, I've always tried to fight corruption, to make the place do the right things uh, and clean, clean the system up, you know, as you would expect a good progressive, you know, kind of opposition to do. And I've been repeatedly politically oppressed and suppressed and silenced for doing all that by directly conflicted judges and without any legal representation. It's unbelievable. And of course, Duvalny, when he was arrested, the first thing he did was call for Abramovich to be sanctioned and for Usmanov mm, yep. to be sanctioned because yes, he too yes. believes yeah. that that's the reason uh, he is uh, you know, having to be facing yeah. this time in prison. And then he too thinks that that is the pressure that needs to be applied on the British government and on the American government in order to change things in Russia, which is you know, sort of where this comes to. At the end of the day, for this transnational trend to be stopped around the world, these people who are coming into the West with their billions and billions of dollars and buying up real estate, which they, you know, money that they gained illegally from the Russian people on behalf of Vladimir Putin, they need to be stopped. I mean, there is no other way to defend democracy until these people get pushed back. Yeah, and it's important to, um, this is one of the things, you know, I, I've, I've learned a great deal from, you know, following, you know, um, LB and others. It's important uh, to under, understand how mafia methodology works. You know, a lot of the people, they, they just get involved in doing something wrong. Not necessarily, I'm not talking about child abuse here. I'm just talking about basic low-level corruption. And people do stuff wrong. They turn a blind eye to crimes. You know, they don't carry out their jobs efficiently or, you know, or lawfully or properly in a non-corrupt way. And it only takes them to do something a little bit wrong like that. Then they're suddenly trapped on the escalator mm -hmm. of, of yeah. greater and greater corruption. That's why so many of the people have done corrupt things on Jersey, like, you know, multiple conspiracies to pervert the course of justice you know, in the actions taken against me in the child abuse investigation, misconduct in public office, you know, racketeering, fraud. The vast majority of those people never imagined for one moment that they were effectively participating in and becoming key components That's in the right. concealment of child abuse or, you know, transnational serial organized crime. But they did. That's and, right. that, and once you've stepped onto that escalator, 
it's very, very difficult to ever step off, especially when you have the kind of absolutely toxic monopoly of power that exists in Jersey. One of the reasons the Jersey mob did this flip the script maneuver against me, one of the reasons why they illegally suspended the good police chief was so that they could then use the police force and the prosecutions to suppress me. And, you know, when that kind of thing happens, it was done, you know, there were multiple motivations for the Jersey establishment. They wanted to cover up the child abuse. They wanted to cover up a lot of other really serious crimes too, including a lot of financial crimes. So they were able to make a profound and frightening example of the police chief and the senior senator in the Jersey parliament. This was like, a, this was like the kind of Jersey equivalent of just gunning somebody down in, in broad daylight in the middle of a street. Now, when mafias do do that kind of thing, it's done as a signal, as a big warning sign to anyone else who might be threatening their business, you know. And so the Jersey equivalent of that was crushing the police chief and crushing the senior senator. And this was done as a warning sign to anyone else on the island who might be thinking about rocking the boat. You know, this was a big, big showpiece by the island's establishment and their allies and supporters and protectors in London to say, see, if you jeopardise this system, we can do this That's to right. people no, no less than the actual police chief and the senior senator. And, you know, if we can do that to these powerful people, you know, in high positions of public responsibility, just imagine what we can do to you, you know, if you start rocking the boat or jeopardizing things for us. So it was very much one of the things that, you know, I call it, the, it's not just a child abuse situation. I use the expression, the Jersey situation to describe everything that's gone so criminally and chaotically wrong on the island. And really the only way, looking at it objectively and impartially, the only way that Jersey will ever get cleaned up in places like Jersey is if this corrupt reversal of the deterrent effect has to get reversed. You know, it's it's the easiest thing in the world on Jersey to do the wrong things. It's made inviting and easy for people. You know, they get nice houses, they get good jobs, promotions, money. They get up the Jersey social, you know, social circle and circuits and all that kind of thing. And it's made so easy and tempting for people to do the wrong thing and Anyone that comes along and tries to do the right thing, clean up the system, you are blocked at every single avenue. And when I was a politician, I was actually, you know, one of the good guys, you know, trying to oppose this stuff. You know, even lot, even before, you know, the child abuse situation came came to light, whenever I tried to do good, progressive, you know, decent things, you know, as a, as a Jersey politician, it was always made nearly impossible to succeed. There were obstacles after obstacle after obstacle put in your path. And whereas if you just kept your mouth buttoned, didn't rock the boat, you could just, you know, lay back and, you know, just, you know, watch the money roll in and have a nice quiet life and get, you know, lots of routine positive stories about you if you were a politician in Jersey's, you know, corrupt rag of a, a newspaper, the Jersey Evening Post. So it was made to do the right thing in Jersey is immensely difficult and it's far, far too easy to do the wrong thing. And so the that that kind of perversion of the deterrent effect has to get reversed. And that's how we can tell the if the UK government um, stops being corrupt and is capable of rescuing itself, this is one of that's one of the yardsticks by which we will be able to judge whether the UK is capable of constitutionally rescuing itself is when that perversion of the deterrent effect is reversed and put back in the correct way as it should be, whereas it's very difficult and hard and frightening and risky to be a crook and to do the wrong thing. And it's much easier and more inviting to be one of the good people and to do the right thing. Could you and run for I senator thought, again? By the way, sorry to interrupt you there, but it's, uh... could I? Yeah, I'm, I, I'm, I'm de facto bankrupt. I mean, when two other good Jersey politicians, Deputy Trevor and Shoda Pittman, were driven out of office, I, actually I was approached to run in one of the resulting by-elections, mm -hmm. and literally the next morning, 
once their seats had been declared vacant, um, they were, they'd been bankrupted out of the Jersey part. Literally the next morning, this was like some years after all these like, ridiculous legal proceedings against me, suddenly a couple of guerrillas from the local judiciary came hammering on my door saying, um, here's a summons to legal proceedings. You you owe the, the Jersey government, I forget what the exact sum was, or something, 250,000 pounds, something like that, to pay for the state cost of the like prosecution uh, and stuff against against me and you know that was you know you can't be a politician if you're bankrupt so they knew immediately you know that was my you know that was their they're putting their kind of wooden stake through my heart you know as a, a potential political problem but if you yeah, had money and, would could you then if you had resources could you then run for office um i i, there, I could do a, a regulation uh, stopping you i guess is what zev's yeah. asking because of the prosecutions against you uh, does that uh, no, I don't. I, I, I don't think so. No, but I mean, I, the the bankruptcy kind of sword of Damocles. You know, you know, I I've, I've got health problems. You know, I, I you know that caused me you know problems. You know, and I I basically my I don't even have a functioning bank account. You know, <laughs> I, I survive. I have to live on on benefits. And frankly, at my age, the thought of going back into all of this toxic, toxic. Mm -hmm environment under the current I mean, my life is in danger okay i expect literally to get killed you know in any day I, I live with that you know i've actually got i have routine death threats including you know like i've had warnings from the jersey police force you know about actual death threats made against me by some very very dangerous individuals i mean the jersey mob has never gone so far yet as engaging in kind of open hits that we see in some of the other European kind of mafia islands. You know, um, everyone was very, very shocked when Daphne Cunha Glizio was murdered yeah. with a car bomb. Um, that kind of thing doesn't happen and hasn't happened on Jersey so far, but it could uh, and, and it probably will one day because the stakes are so immense. We're talking about geopolitical, considerations and you know unimaginable fortunes um you know and basically what i represent and the fact that i'm still fighting this war against you know the the, the jersey the jersey situation i am a the fact that i'm appearing on this program i am a i'm a profound risk i am the most serious and significant political risk and power risk that the ancient jersey mobster system faces so you know, I, I, I have to I have to look at that kind of that kind of yeah. potential. Right. Well, I want to say something to you, Stuart. I, I want to say something to you, okay, so that people can hear that this when they're watching this. Um. So, watching how you handled yourself in the footage in that documentary when you were a senator, and knowing what it's like to be somebody who's trying to blow a whistle, but also mm -hmm. staring at real evil and how difficult that is when you were trying to expose what was going on there. Um, I think you were incredibly heroic and inspiring and showed tremendous strength because you knew you were standing in the right. You knew you were standing in the truth and you knew what your job was, and that was to protect those children. And um, I just want you to know how clear that is to see for everybody who's not on Jersey, that we see you, and that I saw how hard that was for you, and I know how hard that is. And um, so I'm, so I'm sad that it's such a, a, a lonely place right now there for you but I want you to know that um, you have been seen and you have been heard. Well, thank you. That's so kind of you. I mean, I've, people occasionally say that kind of thing to me. Um, but I think the, the remarkable thing is that it's not that there's anything particularly remarkable about me. You know, if you're a politician and, you know, even just a backbench politician, let alone having responsibility for child protection, if you start getting information drawn to your attention that 
child abuse has gone on. Well, you, it's just the, it's the normal thing to want to investigate it and That's right. stop it. That's right. You know, That's right. and and I, you know, I, I'm I'm a carpenter. I'm not, you know, I haven't been to uni. I don't have a good education or whatever. I haven't been to university or anything like that. You know, so there's nothing particularly, you know, smart about me. You know, I'm just a, an ordinary person. The remarkable contrast here is that just how toxic and so far removed from those normal civilized expectations the, 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 the Jersey establishment are and just how, you know, just how and they can't even just see it. Them. They, just, they no. can't even see it. I mean, that was what was clear to me is they just didn't know that thing you were saying about it's so easy to do what's wrong and so hard to do it right and that needs to be reversed. But people who are doing what's wrong, they think they're doing the right thing because it is so easy and because there isn't any pushback mm -hmm. and they think that and they're getting rewarded so handsomely for it. You know, if you had kept your mouth shut and kept doing your job and kept succeeding and climbing the ladder, at the end, I don't think people realize, but at the at the end of that road for you, if you had done what they all were doing, is a knighthood. You know, the queen ends up knighting you. Well, um, that's perhaps, that's, yeah, the, that's yeah. a, I'm just saying that's the top of the career chain there. Um, so it's when when you end up when you end up being quiet and keeping all these things secret and looking in the other way, and then you end up being becoming a sir this or sir that. Um, it's hard to it's hard to grasp maybe that you're the bad guy. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, just, 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 to, just to be clear about that, knighthoods are, are never given to elected politicians on Jersey. Uh, okay, not, not, all right. Not, well, not, not, ministers. It's only, it's only yeah, the lawyers. Uh, that get only the lawyers. <laughs> okay, well, you could have got it, yeah. But I'm just saying that's the, the folks at the top of the top of the thing there. That's what's waiting mm -hmm. for them if they keep, their, if they keep, keep, the, keep the status quo going to where – the wealth can continue to grow. And you know, Stuart, I really do think that there is a... Sorry? Right. I just I was going to say, there really is uh, something remarkable about you. You don't actually get that many people who fight the system for this long um, and who come from the background that you do and are absolute heroes in terms of championing the rights of people who have been uh, violently abused for decades and uh, and never giving up. You never gave up. And uh, even, even in last night, I mean, it was such redemption, I think, for you in terms of the public perception of how yeah. uh, how much you've done over so long, never once have you doubted that, and never once have you given up. And these children and uh, and their families, and frankly, everyone in Jersey should be thanking you for what you've done. Uh, this great disservice that they're treating you like this, and hopefully that can change uh, the more the public becomes yeah. aware of your plight. Well, perhaps I think um, whilst you know the film was very good, um, you know, and you know things like that 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 film and other, you know people like leah mcgrath goodman you know who's worked on these issues you yes. know for like it's probably over yes. a decade you know a, a, alongside me now people have done all kinds of heroic things and we do get these kind of stories and this kind of coverage out there occasionally but i became very you know i've become battle hardened and very experienced about these kind of things and i know that no matter how good it might make you know uh people feel you know that the survivors the whistleblowers or people like me or whatever or even a really great positive media story doesn't actually mean we're going to win the war yet. You know, the, the, right. you know, you know, I, I, you know, I think that I think the cleaning up. I, I hope the you know the 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 getting rid of Trump and that absolutely terrifying, you know, insurrection, which you know I, I watched from this side of the pond and it was terrifying. You know, I think I, I tweeted at the time saying, you know, civilization is hanging by a thread. Yeah. You know, cause had that succeeded, you know, frankly, the world would have been cast into chaos uh, and bedlam. But the, U the USA just managed to save itself just on the precipice. And I'm, ve I'm very hopeful that the USA, you know, will, you know, now, and indeed, you know, it's starting to with better financial regulations. And... I hope in a geopolitical sense, you know, that the USA will use its, you know, influence on places like Britain and, and other places to start cleaning up their act. And, you know, as I was saying before, it's only really when we succeed in reversing that perverse reversal of the deterrent effect, only when we do that, you know, will it become, places like Jersey become safe, you know, and, and clean, you know, and... and I should tell everyone um, that they can watch the documentary 
uh, on the BBC. The show is called Storyville, and the documentary it's called is called Dark Secrets of a Trillion Dollar Island, um, and it aired last night for the first time on BBC Four. Now, there's a little trick if you want if you have a VPN player, you can probably access the BBC player um, and watch it directly. But you have to, um, you know, sign up through a UK server, which means using your VPN. I'm encouraging people to do that, but you could. Um, and if not, no, I'm I, sure I, it will I show think elsewhere. Actually the, film, the film has been posted, I think, on YouTube. Yeah. Now, oh, so good. Okay. I think that might, might be, be easy, long, easy. But yeah, but good. try and look for it. Um, and I want to thank you, Stuart. Thanks for spending time with us tonight and, and telling your story thank so you. givingly. Uh, it's been the longest I mean, show we, we've we ever done, barely, actually. So we, we <laughs> that barely, barely scratched the surface. You know, yeah. this is the, the tip of the tip of the iceberg. And, you know, I. I could go on, you know, and explain lots of other situations and experiences as well. And, you know, I, you know, I'm very grateful for you having gone, and I, I would look forward to, you know, carrying on this dialogue, you know, at some point in the, in the future, because I, I think it's important, you know, for the, well, you know, for the broad public good, you know, that these kind of things get spoken of. Absolutely. And it's important that people realize this is a global war we're fighting against, transnational crime. Um, so that's uh, mm -hmm. that's it for us for tonight. We will see you again on Friday for the after show. Thank you very much for being uh, here with us tonight as we've tackled this really challenging story. Uh, and we'll be back on Friday. Thanks for watching Narrative. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Narrative is funded by viewers like you. Support our independent journalism at patreon.com forward slash narrative. <laughs>